This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, I want to talk about Bible prophecy, specifically what happened in Egypt thousands of years ago when God's people lived under the slavery system, which I call the Pharaoh God King system. Now, when you read about this in the uh, Old Testament, you see that God was punishing his people for violating uh, his laws. And as such, they had to serve in slavery. Then, God finally, in his compassion, sent a deliverer to them. And that deliverer was Moses. Now. Uh, during the day that we call Easter, which is actually the, the not, not the same calendar day as the real Easter, but let's just cut to the chase here. It's the day we've arbitrarily chosen to, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the central point or fact of Christianity. If there's no resurrection of Jesus Christ, if there's no resurrection of the dead, the bottom line is you and I don't have a religion. You know, and when I when I think about that, and I think about the fact that the two fastest growing, the fastest growing religions in America right now are atheism tied with witchcraft or paganism. So, the fastest growing religions in America are witchcraft and atheism. So that means that, think about all the evangelistic efforts uh, by churches, etc. And when the day is done, the, the greatest percentage of people who have been converted the greatest percentage of people who have been, quote, evangelized would be those people who converted, they, they may not use those words, but those people who converted to witchcraft or paganism or those people who converted to atheism. And that implies also that in the conversion process, they, in many cases, many cases, they left the Christian religion and turned towards atheism, which is religion, by the way. It's just the religion of no God. They turned towards atheism or uh, witchcraft. Now, those are horrifying statistics, and they're deeply disturbing. So, think about what, what the primary reason is. The primary reason is, is that people are looking for not only answers, but they're looking for supernatural power that really works, supernatural power by which they might uh, be able to deal with the challenges of life, whatever they are. Uh, supernatural power to overcome adversity, sickness, uh, all of the things that, that we can't control by ourselves. So, on Easter Day, my wife and I were, were talking and and she said we were looking it was later in the day and we were looking for for a particular you know episodic tv or film to watch which is not always that easy as you know because there's so much garbage and so much filth and so much just depravity so you you try to navigate out of that zone and find something that that you know isn't going to 
destroy your soul. So my wife, Chris, asked me, well, you, you want to see the Ten Commandments? And I, so I love the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments is, is a great movie. It still stands up today. But I wasn't all that keen on it because it's like, you know, I've seen the Ten Commandments practically every year of my life. <laughs> I've seen it a lot of times. And anyway, so we went for it because it was either that or, you know, some some movie about some demon-possessed girl or something. And that, you know, I'm not even interested in watching that garbage. Because when, when they make movies like that, they make them because they, they have lost the ability to write, direct, act at a, at a creative level that is compelling and engaging. So they, they go for the lowest common denominator. You know, they go for cheap thrills, which is always like sex, and violence, or some horror, demonic, depraved movie. So, you know, we're watching the Ten Commandments, and I'm immediately captivated again by the same movie that I've seen so many times. And my mind can't help but... Uh, despite the fact that the film was, was not directed by Cecil B. DeMille to be, you know, he's not a Bible teacher. He's not a minister. And and now his job was to entertain mass audiences and, and grab their attention. And he did that very well. No, it's not theologically perfect. And if that's what you're expecting, then you need to read the Bible. It, it has imperfections theologically. But the main message, the main storylines are communicated in that, in that movie. And so as you're watching the Pharaoh, you know, you realize that the Pharaoh was uh, played by Ewell Brenner. And I remember the movie from when I was a kid, because Ewell Brenner would say, or the people around him, would say after Yul Brenner uh, playing the Pharaoh would give you know mighty Egypt an order and his mighty generals or sorcerers orders they would say so shall it be written so shall it be done and that, that's that line has always stuck in my head so shall it be written so shall it be done and and you look at Yul Brenner in this movie, and you realize once again that the Pharaoh, which is based on the real person recorded in the historical account in the Bible, the Pharaoh is not only the Pharaoh God King, which is a term I have come up with for uh, describing how a globalist or a cult elite, a globalist elite, or a Luciferian elite, how they, throughout human history, one of the ways they manage to establish total control, total dominion, total domination of their nations and their empires, etc. You know, they just don't walk into the throne room of of Pharaoh and, and, and begin to rule the world through the, their empires. They, they have been schooled. They have been taught in secret occultic mystery schools. People don't understand this today because they've been dumbed down. You see, people today, when they go and get an education, they're not getting an education, they're getting an indoctrination. And so they, they don't have the ability to process historical information in their brain. They don't have that ability. Nor do they have the ability to make sense of the historical information. Nor are they even given an opportunity in the school system, which I call the mind control factories to process the information. 
Now, what am I talking about? What I'm talking about is that worldly rulers since the beginning of time, that would include all of the empires and the kingdoms and the super civilizations, such as ancient Egypt, one of the world's greatest empires, uh, such as the Roman Empire, the the Medo-Persian Empire, and all the other empires, like the British Empire, the American Empire, but and the Babylonian Empire, of course. But the, the hidden dynamic that they don't want you to know about is that all of these rulers, whether they're kings or queens or prime ministers or pharaohs or whatever they are, presidents, they're ruling according to a a planning system that they have been taught. And the way the planning system works is simply like this. If you want to make the people your slaves, if you want to dominate the masses and rule and reign over the masses, in any given nation on planet Earth, then there are basic things that you must do and implement. And these basic things that that you will implement not only give you the spiritual power to rule and reign, they give you the psychological force, the economic power, which produces the military power, etc., etc. So in other words, these men are trained and educated in what I call, and I explain it and break it down for you in my books, like The Greatest Battle and Concrete Matrix, etc. They're trained to rule and reign in a system that I call the Pharaoh God King system. And I very carefully chose those words to explain what I believe is one of the most important historical truths that there is. But when you attend any school system, essentially, especially in the United States, you don't even hear a whisper of this concept. Why? Because they don't want you to know it even exists. That's why they go to such enormous effort to hide it in a system of secret societies. and They pass it on from empire to empire uh, through secret occult societies and, and other secretive organizations that utilize secret principles and secret plans. And the dumbed-down American kids and adults are deprived of of knowing anything about this. Christian kids going to evangelical schools or going to churches that should be receiving, by the way, they should be receiving a religious instruction that encompasses a working understanding of the Pharaoh God King system, because it's mentioned so often in the Bible, in the Old Testament especially. So if God went to such great lengths to teach us about what the Bible calls Mystery Babylon, and Mystery Babylon is the Bible's name, for this secret, satanic, occult, power-ruling system. The Bible goes to great lengths to to explain that to us in God's Word. Now, I want to come back in a second and, and focus in on that, what it means for you and I today, 
and why it, it is imperative for your survival, for your ability to be an overcomer, for you to fulfill your mission before God. It is imperative that you understand that this system does, this secret system, along with its secret societies, does actually exist. And the Bible teaches you that it exists. And the Bible teaches you about the nature and laws of its existence. And why why is that so? Because God knows that you need to have a knowledge of truth, but a knowledge of that truth specifically, in order to be an overcomer and in order to survive, especially, especially in the time period that you and I live in, where the Bible calls this time period the last days. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. We'll be back in just a second. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Take advantage of all our videos. You can watch our Roku channel, our our many video prophetic alerts, our uh, archives of the Paul McGuire Report. Get yourself a copy of The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Souls of Mankind in the History of the World and uh, Conquering the Matrix and learn. Knowledge is power. And that's why, inevitably, when people do not have knowledge, they have no power. And when people do not have power, they are slaves. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. We'll be back in just a moment. This is Paul McGuire. So I I, I was watching uh, the Ten Commandments, which, which I've seen, like, countless times. And really, the Ten Commandments as is the case in, in a number of other movies, it gives you a brilliant portrayal, and it also teaches you brilliantly this whole Pharaoh God King system concept. It, it makes it visual for you. You see, that's how people need to be taught. That's, that's how you communicate knowledge, which gives people power. That's what you're not being given. That's what you're being deprived of in the school system. Do you think that John Dewey, who is one of the founders of the public education system in America, he basically established, he and some others, established the framework of our entire public educational system. And when did he do that? He did that when he came back from the communist Russian Revolution, or the Bolshevik Revolution. When he returned from the communist revolution in Russia and came back to the United States in 1917. 1917, by the way, is the official year of the Bolshevik or Russian communist revolution. So he was there intentionally and on purpose to learn, to be discipled, and to be trained in communist-style education. And what is communist-style education? Communist-style education is really indoctrination. It's brainwashing. It's mind control. It's not designed to educate. It's designed to indoctrinate. So everything the student learns in the classrooms has nothing. They don't want the students to know the truth in a communist system. They want the students to have their brains shaped and molded in a particular way that supports the communist dictatorship and the communist totalitarian regime. Okay? That's what we have going on today. And anybody who can't see that is a fool. All right, so it's essential to know this because when the communists had their revolution in Russia, and then they began to immediately 
tear down the old educational system, and they began to implement a new communist educational system built on brainwashing and mind control and indoctrination. That is an essential part of a communist revolution because that ensures that the people will never rebel against their communist masters. They will never complain against the the tyranny of communism. They they won't question it. They they will they're they're trained to be obedient and slave like from the youngest ages. That's the purpose of a communist education. It's not to make you educated, it's to brainwash you. And this, by the way, this what we're talking about is a principle. It has many names. When I talk about it and I refer to Egypt, I call it the Pharaoh God King system. And it's been around for a long time. But you see, this is the great secret that they don't want to be brought out into the light. They don't want you and others to know that this even exists. They want to brainwash you to such a heightened degree that you're incapable of understanding that it even exists. Because this is how they rule the world. This is how they rule a nation. This is how they rule over you and they rule over your family. This is how they have taken a once free nation based on principles of freedom embedded in our governmental documents like the Bill of Rights and the Constitution and so on and so forth, where America, unique among the nations, we have liberties and freedoms undreamed of in in communist nations. We have freedom of religion, freedom of the press, uh, freedom to assemble, freedom of speech, or at least we did. At least we did. And it was the founder, founders of the United States of America, that was their intention when they created America. Now, America, and you never learned this, this is important, this is what we're talking about now, this is the most important stuff. If you don't know this, You don't know anything. And that's what we have in America today. We got millions of students, millennials, and other generations. Stupidity is not exclusive to millennials. Stupidity existed in my generation and in your generation. Long before uh, certain biological pandemics existed, we have had a pandemic of viral stupidity uh, and ignorance and a lack of historical knowledge that has been at epidemic proportions for since the beginning of our nation. Why? Because the people who really rule America from behind the curtain, and yes, there are rulers who rule America and every other nation from behind the curtain. They don't want the masses of people to know the truth, because if the masses of people knew the truth, um, they, they would be a danger to those that are trying to enslave them. You know, this is this is really simple stuff. But get a hold of it. It will set you on fire spiritually. It will change your life, change your children, change your grandchildren's life. If you don't get a hold of it, 
It will bring you down into slavery, unspeakable slavery. You say, Paul, how, how can you be so sure of yourself? Not that I'm sure of myself. It's just that reality has a history to it. Our world has a history to it. Every person's life has a history to it. You have a history in your life. I don't know how old you are. I feel like I was sitting next to you. I could probably guess. Um, and and depending upon you know what generation or whatever I thought you might be born in, then the chances are you would have experienced this, this, that, and the other. And that shapes your your mind. It shapes your perception. It shapes your reality. So, for example, in my generation, I was a very young boy. I don't remember how young I was. And I remember seeing the television footage and, and screams of my mother and screams of neighbors. I mean, literally, they were screaming. One scream, there was screaming of horror and pain and anguish as President John F. Kennedy sitting in an open convertible driving through Texas was blown away by an assassin or assassins, depending upon which historical report you, you read. And that, that, that horrific event of trauma and chaos shaped an entire generation. Okay. So, the point is that that's part of America's history. Good, bad, or ugly, it's part of America's history. But it's also part of our individual histories. Most of us listening to this program today in the USA and throughout the world, we were alive when the twin trade towers came down. I can remember it. You probably can remember it as if it was yesterday. The horror of... I was standing at the train station in the dark, commuting to work, commuting to to the radio station that I, that I, because I had to travel 180 miles round trip to do my daily four hour live nationally syndicated drive time talk show called the Paul McGuire show. So in order to cut down on the car driving part of it, I, um, had to create uh, my own alternative way of, of getting to and from work. So that meant I had my regular car, but I had an older car that really I just hung on to for whatever reason and kept in the garage of our house. But eventually what I did is I had the, the car that I drive, et cetera, et cetera. This is back then. And then Parked at the other end of Southern California, way down in Orange County, by the airport, I had a train station. My other car was parked. So I, I got up in the morning, drove one car to the train station up here in northern Los Angeles County, in the dark, waiting for our train to come. And then what was going to happen is, well, what did happen was that I got on the train, then I would get off that train at uh, the, the main train station in Lo downtown Los Angeles. Then I would switch train lines to the Orange County line, and I would take a second train all the way down to Orange County, and I would get off and drive my other car, an older car, to the radio station. Okay? So as we're out there, in that commute, by the way, 
even using the trains, was about three hours, three and a half hours, four hours each way. So all of a sudden, I hear all this gossiping and stuff, and, and gasps, and and at this time, not everybody's cell phone had the ability to play video and stuff. That's all I remember. So, but enough people did have cell phones that could play at least some kind of video or or photographs. And there I was in the dark watching the trade towers, you know, the smoke and, and the whole deal. And that was a horrific memory like the Kennedy assassination that embeds itself in your consciousness and shapes who you are. It becomes part of America's history. It becomes a a key part of your own personal history. And so the point is, every one of us, we have a history. And in our own personal histories, we have made choices, good, bad, and ugly. And when we make good choices, usually, not all the time, we experience blessing. When we make bad choices, or sometimes sinful choices, we, we uh, reap what we sow. We, we can receive the chastisement of God. We can experience bad outcomes by making bad choices. So the name of the game is, is that God has set up our world so that we might learn by history. We might learn by our past mistakes, either in our personal lives, collectively, spiritually, individually, and nationally, and as a planet. Okay, so where am I getting at? Where I'm getting at, knowing history is important because history and acquiring historical knowledge gives you the lessons of history, good or bad, and if you're willing to know the lessons of history, if you're willing to be taught the lessons of history, if you're willing to know all that and to study the lessons of history, the knowledge of history can be an incredible source of great blessing and protection for you or any individual or group. And you've heard that expression. Those that do not learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it. So, when you deprive generation after generation of young people or adults or whatever, when you deprive them of the opportunity of learning the lessons of history, then you're damning them. You're guaranteeing that they're going to suffer and pay a very heavy price and experience some very, very negative things because you have deprived them of the opportunity of learning from the lessons of history And as such, because they didn't get the opportunity to learn the lessons of history, they're going to have to suffer and learn the lessons of history in the present tense. And that's not the way God created it. Only a terrible parent wouldn't share with his child or her child the lessons of their own personal history. You know. A mother often does this, or sometimes it's a father to their daughter or son in terms of trying to impart wisdom uh, to them regarding choosing a potential marriage partner or mate, and they try to use their life experience as a living lesson so that that they might make the right choice in in terms of of the the character, the temperament, the quality of what makes a good marriage partner. Another example would be um, how different 
political economic systems or ideologies work. Okay, so if you have the benefit of knowing history, so that would mean, let's say you had the benefit of being able to look back 150 years uh, of history, and you could see historical examples, you could see photographs, you could read reports, newspaper articles, perhaps film or whatever, and you could see exactly for your own eyes what a communist, Marxist, or socialist system will inevitably bring about. And inevitably, I'm not talking about momentary exceptions for a couple of years here and there, but momentarily, they all bring about the same thing, which is tyranny, totalitarianism, poverty, slavery, no social justice, no redistribution of wealth, no freedom of religion, no freedom of the press, no freedom of speech. So, so then young people, millennials, or whatever you want to talk about, don't have to go back in time and repeat the same horrible mistakes over and over again with all the unnecessary suffering. You see, if you if you say if you're operating from the place of love your neighbor as yourself, okay? Well, I mean let's get real. Let's quit playing Chuck E. Cheese Christianity for crying out loud. Chuck E. Cheese Christianity, just gooey, stupid, and, and irrelevant. Look, this is how it works, okay? It's very simple. If the people you love, if you say you love your neighbor as yourself, and you better because God's Ten Commandments say, love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord thy God above everything else. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's how you fulfill the whole of the law. You love your neighbor as yourself. So if you really loved your neighbor as yourself, if you really loved your own children as yourself, then you would do anything you could to spare them the incredible grief and suffering that awaits them if they go down certain pathways in life. I have never met anybody I remember when I used to do the Paul McGuire show, nationally syndicated, four hours a day, drive time, okay? I I could count on this like clockwork. All the Christians that would call into the program that were like sympathetic or warmed up towards uh, Marxism and socialism and communism and thought that would be a, a great thing, those were usually, without exception, um, American. Christians. Christians raised in America, in the United States. Only those people believed in the fantasy land promises of communism, Marxism, and and stuff like that. All right? Because they had never seen or lived through the real thing. See, they were in love with what they were told about what communism, Marxism, and socialism was. But they had never really experienced it and lived through it. Now, those were the biggest supporters of communism, socialism, and Marxism on college campuses or anywhere. The cheerleaders for communism, Marxism, socialism, etc. are those people who have never lived under it. And then, in contrast, um, in northern, a little north of San Francisco, I forgot where it was, there was a huge community of Christians that used to listen to my radio program uh, in the Northern California station. And 100% of these people, when they called in, were militantly, vehemently against communism, Marxism, and socialism. And the reason for that is is that there was a population of, you know, I don't know, several hundred thousand or 300, 400,000 people in a particular relatively large geographic area where these people had all escaped or their parents had all escaped 
from a particular communist nation in Eastern Europe. I can't remember the name of the communist nation. So they had all lived under communism, Marxism, and socialism in this communist nation in Eastern Europe. And, or their parents had. But most of them had experienced it too. And they knew firsthand from their own firsthand experience of communism what a hellish, horrible, cruel, dictatorial, suffering system this whole thing was. And they, they because they had firsthand knowledge of the horrors of communism, were getting on the radio because I let people say what they wanted to say when they called into the show. And they would plead with their American brothers and sisters. They would plead with them to wake up and to get educated and understand what communism and Marxism and socialism is really about. And they would describe it because I would I would question them. And they would describe the nightmare the daily nightmare it was living under a communist totalitarian system. Why? Because they actually experienced it. Not the lie of what it was supposed to be. They actually experienced it. Another case in point. Whenever I would talk to people who came from Cuba, and I'm talking about, you know, Fidel Castro and his brother, the other Castro, and Cuba is a brutal, it was even a more brutal communist nation and communist dictatorship. And so all the uh, Cubans uh, who grew up in Cuba, or, or parents grew up in Cuba, and, and some many escaped Cuba and came to the United States, and that entire population of people that managed to escape Cuba or whose parents lived in Cuba, or they did as kids, they all, and they were Christians, they all lived under, firsthand, the communist system of Cuba, and they suffered, and they saw the horrors, and the dictatorship, and the cruel totalitarian state of Cuba, and how horrible it was to live there. It was so horrible to live there that these people would jump into the shark-infested waters. It's like it's somewhere off the coast of Florida, not that familiar with the area. And they would risk their lives swimming in shark-infested waters or clinging on to a, uh, a big piece of wood or something to get to the United States to find freedom. None of them, none of them would ever, ever think for a second about voting for a communist, socialist, Marxist political program or candidate. See how this works? People who have learned from history because they experienced it firsthand know the truth about it. So when you deliberately deprive or censor the truth, the knowledge, the history of what real communism what real Marxism and what real socialism is really all about, so people can't make an informed decision, what happens is they get brainwashed. They get brainwashed because they get told all these seductive lies about how wonderful communism, Marxism, and socialism is. But for those people who really had to live through it, it was a living hell on earth. So you have all these these privileged white kids on college campuses across the United States. You also have, in my opinion, relatively privileged kids from uh, 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 different ethnic groups, and they share something in common. They, they, they're all in love with the idea, the romantic idea or the idealized idea of living under a Marxist, socialist, communist state. And so when you hear these politicians and leaders and thinkers and activists speak on TV or wherever, they make communism and socialism and Marxism sound so wonderful and attractive. It's going to bring about social justice 
redistribution of the wealth, a worker's paradise. And all of those things are lies, 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 because that's not the way it is at all. And the people that are trying to wake them up, those are the young people whose parents actually had to live in a communist hellhole or a Marxist socialist hellhole. They want nothing to do with it. They know how evil, how satanic this whole thing is. And see, I titled my book, you know, on one hand, I apologize for, for constantly naming the title of my book. But on the other hand, I do myself and you a disservice by not mentioning the title of the book, because the title of the book encapsulizes, if that's a word, the passion, the fervency, and love of the truth I have, and the desire, the overwhelming desire I have to break through to people that are being hypnotically programmed and hypnotically brainwashed and hypnotically indoctrinated into into becoming communists and socialists and marxists because in their brain in their brainwashing process they're being seduced by a spiritual lie okay and the reason i have this passion you say, Paul, well, why, do you have, why, why do you have this passion? You didn't live in a communist nation. You're right, but I read, I studied, I talked to people, I interviewed people, I found out about it. You think I just listened to the idiots in the school system? God forbid. No, I didn't listen to the idiots in the school system. They have no idea what they're talking about. I could tell you stories today that I won't talk all over the air. I, I know many things that I don't talk about over the air. about what's really going on. And let me say this. One of the things I did in my studies is I read the books of this uh, minister, Richard Wormbrand. And I think the name of his book, I'm not sure, is Tortured for Christ. And he describes being arrested and tortured and imprisoned uh, in, in the most horrible ways uh, because he lived in a communist dictatorship in Eastern Europe. And he doesn't describe the fantasy of what communism is. He describes, he's a Christian, he loves the Lord, but he describes in, in realistic detail what, what it's actually like to be a Christian and a minister or, or, or somebody who loves Jesus and live in a communist dictatorship in uh, uh, Europe, in a communist nation in Europe. And when you read his book, the scales should fall off your eyes. He describes, and I'm going to spare you of it. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you a quick count to ten because we're going to enter some uh, adult material, and there's no way I can convey the truth of what this pastor experienced in a communist nation without being somewhat graphic. So I'm going to have to be graphic. So you're going to have to turn down the, the program if you have young children listening, or you're easily offended. So I'm going to count to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is for adults only. So I'm reading his book, and he's describing the experience of these naive but godly nuns, these nuns who really love the Lord in this communist nation. But, you know, they had kind of a shallow, superficial uh, relationship with Jesus, where they were just taught all the pleasantries, they were just taught all the, you know, just trust the Lord kind of cliches, you know what I'm talking about. And he doesn't, he doesn't describe the situation in a lewd or perverse manner. He, he describes it in, in, in best he can as in a journalistic manner. 
but how these communist revolutionaries would capture these nuns who really loved Jesus and were trying to walk with Jesus, and how these nuns, day after day, would be sexually raped and abused in the most horrific ways, in the most vulgar and disgusting ways, as the totalitarian communist soldiers, you know, enjoyed their suffering and enjoyed debasing these these nuns. And these nuns were were at, they felt like killing themselves. They were in a hell that whose fires were so bright, the, the darkness was so deep, because they were totally unprepared for the ugly realities of communism. And the same thing happened has happened in nation after nation because communism and Marxism and socialism always proceed to lies and spiritual seduction or propaganda or mind control and brainwashing. So the people who are conquered and become its slaves are never prepared for what it really is, how bad it really is. And so when you look at history, you can see that the atrocities just didn't happen in the National Socialist regime of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, where you see the piles of naked, dead bodies uh, in the Holocaust. No, it happened in these communist nations, too, where they killed tens of millions of people. And yes, hundreds of millions of people over a period of about 125 years in communist nations like China and Cuba and North Vietnam, and uh, East Germany, and on and on, and Russia, and Communist China today, literally is selling the organs and tissues, right? They're, They're just carving up the bodies of Christians who are alive and slaving away in prison camps and they'll just cut them open and sell pieces of their organs or their organs or whatever on the black market or sell the women or the boys or the children or the girls to be sex slaves. It's, un, it's, it's, a, it's an abomination beyond belief. Yet it happens in every single communist, Marxist, socialist nation. Now, when you deprive people from knowing the truth about what communism and socialism is, and you just tell them flowery lies about what it is, then, it's only then when they wake up living, you see, it's all seduction. It's like, it's like you know, the Bible talks about the seductive women. Well, they're seductive men too, but seductive women. And, and they entrap stupid men. And so communism does the same thing and traps people. And and it promises everything. Social justice. You know, we'll we'll celebrate diversity. We'll make sure everybody has wonderful health care. Everybody will have a great job and a great income. Everybody will have a nice house and plenty of food. All of these lies. Oh, don't worry about it. You'll have more freedoms in a communist nation than any other kind of nation. So people drop their guard, and and they open the door to communism. And when communism takes over with its secret police, when the people begin, here are some of the the early warning signs that a communist revolution is underway. The communist-style government always encourages the population of its nation to spy on one another and and then they can arrest the people and send them to concentration camps or prison camps. Another thing they do in communist nations is they use psychiatry um, they weaponize psychiatry and so the way that works is that if you disagree with communism or Marxism on economic or political grounds or or 
things like that. If you disagree with it, if you think it's a, a, a bad system, then instead of arguing with you on the debate on the merits of the system, you will be died for, for 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 daring to believe that communism is a terrible system for economic reasons. You will be diagnosed as a sociopath or a psychopath, or you'll be diagnosed with some other psychiatric disorder with a fancy name. You will be locked up in a mental hospital, chained up in a mental hospital, and you will be drugged heavily with antipsychotic drugs, which basically is like being drunk out of your mind. You don't even know where you are. And so you're in a prison, but it's a it's a weird kind of prison. You're locked up, chained, bound, and enslaved, but it's all under the charade of that you have a serious, dangerous, sociopathic mental illness. And so they call that you know, politicizing psychiatry. So if you disagree with communism, your diagnosis is being insane. This is pretty evil. Very evil system. You understand that, right? Because there's no recourse. Once it, it starts out seduction, there's a formula to it. They've been practicing this for close to 200 years. The phase one is the seduction. All the promises. How they're going to create a utopia. Feed everybody. Everybody will have a great job. Everybody will have great health care. There'll be reforms of everything. There'll be, you know, celebration of diversity. No one's going to pick on you, no matter what your sexual preference is. Everything is celebrated. You'll have total free speech. And all of these things are lie upon lie upon lie upon lie upon lie. The fact of the matter is, you will have absolutely no free speech. You will have no freedom of religion. You will have no freedom of assembly. You will have no freedom of the press. You will no communist regime on planet Earth would ever, ever allow its citizens to own or possess guns. Despite the fact that Chairman Mao, who was head of the Revolutionary Communist Party, of Communist China, and I quote him in my book, I, t- I talk about all of this in my book, I explain it in great detail in my book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. I quote Chairman Mao, head of the Communist Party in Communist Russia, who said these words, all power flows from the barrel of a gun. And what he meant by that is that in any political or social struggle, the person that wins. This is according to an expert in communist revolutions. This is according to a hardcore communist revolutionary. He said the number one principle you need to understand is that all power in a political struggle, an economic struggle, or a social struggle, all power flows from the barrel of a gun. What he was saying was, You don't stand a chance in the communist revolution if you're not the one holding the guns and the ammunition. If you're the dingbat who doesn't have a gun or ammunition, and it's the revolutionaries or the soldiers that have all the guns and bullets, Chairman Mao was basically slapping people in the head and saying, wake up, stupid. It's over. You've lost. You're on your way to a prison camp to be shot, tortured, chopped to pieces. That's why he said it. He said it to to drive home the point. All power flows from the barrel of a gun. You see, you've got to understand these things. It's a life and death situation. In the philosophy and ideology of communism, which I break down for you in my books, Conquering the Matrix, Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World, A Prophecy of the Future of America, Volume 2, 
2016 to 2017. In all of these books, I break down the truth of communism, revolutions, and mind control and brainwashing because they work hand in hand. And you have to understand that Chairman Mao, when these guys said what they said, they meant it. They weren't like, you know, playing games. When he said all power flows from the barrel of a gun, he meant that the reason he was able to have a successful communist revolution in China was because he and all his revolutionaries had guns and ammunitions and tanks and machine guns. That's why they won. The communist believes in the concept of brute force. Brute force. The idea is that uh, the fittest survive. It's a Darwinian evolution. And the communists and the Marxists believe this. They believe in the principle which goes by these words, by any means necessary. So the communist is allowed to do anything, no matter how evil, no matter how cruel, no matter how totalitarian, no matter how sadistic, no matter how satanic, it's perfectly acceptable. It's perfectly legitimate. Because according to communist doctrine, no matter how evil a thing may be you plan on doing, it's totally acceptable by any means necessary. That's one of their key uh, belief systems. You can kill, shoot, murder, torture, rape by any means necessary if it fulfills the goal of a communist revolution. So you're allowed to lie, cheat, steal, murder, rape. No perversion is, is withheld from you. Anything goes if it's for the name of communism. Now, I'm telling you this for a reason. And I tell you this for a reason quite often. You've seen the back of my book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. And if you haven't, you can go to the website, paulmcguire.us, or you can go to the Facebook page. By the way, on the Facebook page, the, 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 the private page is limited to 5,000 people. So we went way over 5,000 people. So. When you visit, join, follow, like, watch the Paul McGuire Facebook page. But we have two Paul McGuire Facebook pages, and we have a Paradise Mountain Church page. So if, if the one that you go to only takes 5,000 people and it's all filled up, which it basically is, then join the other public figure Paul McGuire Facebook page. And I should have told you this earlier. But by joining that page, I've hooked it up in such a way that you're going to get all the benefits, all the articles, all the videos, all the photographs, all the announcements. You'll be able to get all of it <clears throat> on the Paul McGuire public figure Facebook page. Okay, So you need to do that. Don't be discouraged and say, well, he told me to sign up and it's all, you know, there's no more room. There is plenty of room if you do it that way. Okay, so <clears throat> here's the critical thing. Um, on those pages, you'll see a copy of my book, The Greatest Battle for the Arts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. And then there's a large photograph in the back of the book, the back glossy color photo page. And it's a picture of me standing at the information booth uh, in Grand Central Station in Manhattan, New York. For those of you who have been there, that's where all the trains, the commuter trains, come into Grand Central Station, which is kind of an elegant, classy, gigantic train station because it's been there for, like, forever. And you'll see a picture of me, and I'm standing with my arms folded, we just did a little impromptu photograph that my wife took of. Didn't, didn't even think about it. Just grabbed the shot. So it turned out to be 
me standing under the information booth, and then on top of the information booth is there. There's this giant, golden, elegant clock, and we're like sixty seconds or a minute before midnight, and that has a symbolic meaning. Obviously, what that is, <clears throat> and then behind the giant, elegant clock, ready to strike midnight, there's a giant uh, U.S. flag. And that, too, is symbolic. So the picture on the back of the book is communicating through symbolism the the hour of the time, the danger that we're in, and other things. And if you look at it, you will see there's at least five critically important symbolic images where I'm kind of like out in the open communicating to you information that I wouldn't want to necessarily say out loud or verbally, so I'm communicating to you symbolically. Now, what you're going to notice and discover as we continue to communicate with you through this ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries in Paradise Mountain Church, You're going to notice me every once in a while, kind of like, for lack of better words, weave in and out of certain themes, certain discussions, or use certain words that bring up certain symbolic meanings. Now, I'm telling you right out in the open what I'm doing. I am experimenting with communicating to you, our partners, the people that we connect to all over the world and in the U.S. on a daily basis. What I'm doing is I'm experimenting with different methods of using symbolism, words, locations, verbiage. And what I'm doing is I'm coming right out and communicating all kinds of important spiritual information. And if you open your eyes and remember the various themes, the various things I've been repeating over and over again on the Paul McGuire Report for the last number of years, those teachings provide the master key to, in effect, decode what I'm trying to communicate to you. So, Paul, what are you talking about? Well, that's a good good question. What I'm talking about is that the entire Internet, like in any communist-type system, is being more censored and more censored and more censored. And it's not even people who are doing the majority of the censorship. It's algorithms. It's computer bots. It's artificial intelligence. And they'll, they'll play off key words, key pictures, key content, and they'll shut you down. They'll block you. They'll censor you. And that, that then uh, becomes a means of blocking my ability to connect with you and communicate with you. So I've decided, I've decided to communicate with you in non-traditional methods. And I already said what they were. Now, when you listen to the program and you pay attention, and if you listen with your ears and see with your eyes, you will notice that um, there's a multi-dimensional content. Now, you're saying, why did you do all this? Well, you'll know, but here's the the point I want to really make sure it's home. To people who are students of the Bible, which is most of you, to people that have been listening to me, which means we have some kind of relationship, electronic or whatever, you already have been given the keys of decoding the message. And what that does is it enables me to 
erect a filter because you see people who don't like God don't read his word. People who would be considered enemies of what we're saying, they never read the word of God. So they they can't possibly take advantage of the keys of communication. So you see, there's kind of a built-in safeguard here where people who love Jesus, people who read the word of God on a regular basis, and people who have been in relationship with me and in this ministry, even just electronically over the last number of years, you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. You're going to know exactly what I'm trying to communicate. And so it is just I'm doing this because I'm trying to teach in a hostile environment. Because I, the wise man looks ahead and sees the danger. The wise man uh, sees the danger, the danger ahead. And so I'm proactively implementing communication styles that are designed to be easily unzipped and opened by people who love God and love his word. Isn't this, a, this is a beautiful thing, because God has given us a built-in and the most secure communication system known to mankind. Everybody's concerned about having encrypted information, a secure communication system, well, that's good. But by utilizing the love of God's Word by God's people, the understanding of Bible prophecy by God's people, by utilizing those factors, <clears throat> along with the other factors I just mentioned, <clears throat> I have, I, you and I can communicate what I can, would call God's encryption. Because it's encrypted to people that don't, it's, a, it's encrypted to safeguard us from intrusion from people who don't like God. Isn't that wonderful? I think God has a sense of humor. I hope you're really tracking with me. I hope you're really thinking outside the box. This is not like Looney Tunes box. This is like, think outside of the box, baby. That's how you win. You don't win by thinking inside the box. That could become your coffin. All right, I think we're running out of time. And um, I want to encourage you to get the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world, along with conquering the matrix. Why? Because I just flipped this open. Chapter 17 of my book, The Greatest Battle. Here's the title, Illuminati Goals and Planetary Dictatorship. The goal is not just a communist dictatorship on a national level. Their goal is a national dictatorship, a communist dictatorship on a national level. That's their goal. And the people who are really financing it and planning it are the Illuminati. It's an, it's an occult-based revolution, right? And in my studies of 40 years of the Illuminati and kinds of things, I'm reading to you from The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. And let me just read you this as quickly as I can. This, this chapter says, The 25 Goals of the Globalist Elite, the Illuminati Goals, one, all men are more easily inclined towards evil than good to the fallen nature of man. Number two goal of the Illuminati, preach liberalism. Parentheses. It is easier to create a social political system that appears to man's fall, that appeals to man's fallen nature than attempt to restrict it. Number three, Illuminati goal. Use the, use the idea of freedom to bring about class wars. Parentheses. The creator created men and women to be free. However, once the powers of revolution are released, 
they often will not be able to exercise the proper moral restraint and will seek out freedom to steal and oppress others, again, due to man's fallen nature. Number four, Illuminati goal. Any and all means should be used to reach the Illuminati goals as they are justified. Justified by who, Satan? But not justified by God. Parentheses. The central tenet of the Illuminati is that man is God. The God of the Illuminati is not the biblical God, but Satan. In a world that is devoid of the commandments of the Creator, revolutionary transformation can be brought into being by any means necessary. The end justifies the means. Parentheses. Number five Illuminati goal, the right to lie and force. Now, I want you to really, don't, you know, throw this out of your head. You've got to embrace it, man, because this is where these people are coming from. And if you, if you, if you think that they're nice people, they're going to take you down. So, this is their principle, number f- Illuminati principle number five, the right to lie and force. Parentheses, the Illuminati or Marxist tenet, by all means necessary, allows that lying, murder, horrific evil, or deception of any kind is fully justifiable and fully encouraged. Parentheses, okay. Think of all the super chaos events that have occurred in the last 50 years in America and around the world. Think of the tragedies. Think of the bombs. Think of the wars. Think of the total chaos. Think of the mass murder. Think of the shock and awe. Think of trauma. Think of cruelty. Got it? Because that's what these people think of, and they don't have any problem with it whatsoever. Illuminati goal number six. Oh, Oh, excuse me. Let's go back to number five. The Illuminati or Marxist threat, by all means necessary, it allows them to lie, murder, conduct horrific evil or deception of any kind is fully, fully, fully justifiable and fully, fully, fully encouraged. Number six Illuminati goal. The power of our resources must remain invisible until the very moment it has gained the strength that no cunning force can undermine it. Well, that means their name of their game is that they lie low, they lie low, they lie low. Then when they have enough velocity, enough strength, enough numbers, enough money, then they strike and they go for the jugular. Parentheses, the power of the Illuminati and the hidden forces that seek to implement a godless world communist revolution must be concealed as a strategic means until it is prudent and necessary to reveal the full magnitude of the Illuminati's resources. A lot of these Christians, man, that are just, you know, we have a a very sugary donut store in California. I don't know if you have it. I forgot what it's called. forgot what it's called. I blanked out. It's probably the sweetest donut known to man. It's also highly addictive. Okay, so. uh, Number seven, Illuminati principle. Avocation of mob psychology to control the masses. What this means is that the Illuminati game plan uses, listen carefully, Mob psychology to control the masses. Parentheses. I'm reading to you from my book. The preferable method of enslaving and conquering the masses is through scientific mind control, hypnosis, brainwashing, sorcery, and propaganda. Once you have conquered a man's mind, there is little need for military force. So so they use mob psychology to control the masses. And they use chaos, order out of chaos. So why do you think 
uh, a while back, not all that long ago, we had riots in the streets all over America. Why do you think we had stores being burnt down, stores being looted, cops being shot and killed, demonstrators being shot and killed? Why do you think we had anarchy, bloodshed, murder, killing, anarchy, highly organized, billions of dollars spent on it, and some of the world's most powerful billionaires were secretly financing this mob psychology. Because what this does is it creates their intended goal, which is mass hysteria. And the purpose of mass hysteria is to control the masses. Are you starting to see what they're doing? They're doing it right in front of your eyes. That's why, look, I'm, I'm going to tell you this directly, and I'm not going to pull any punches. That's why all those pastors who look the other way, who pretend they can't see, who stand up and say nothing, who act like the three blind mice and never warn the people, all of those pastors, without exception, are fully accountable before God for their abdication of their responsibility as watchmen at the wall. <clears throat> God says to those pastors, evangelical, I'm going to hold the blood of my people on your hand. Parentheses, the preferable method of enslaving and conquering the masses is through scientific mind control, hypnosis, brainwashing, sorcerer, and propaganda. Once you have conquered a man's mind, there is little need for military force. Why do you think that they're training our little boys and girls, starting in second grade, with the most X-rated, triple X-rated, perverse sexual programming, sexual education curriculum, and that it's their brainwashing? Why do you think that our little children are seeing full adult triple x rated films featuring pornography of every kind and uh experimentation i i hate to admit it to you but i've read the curriculum i i saw the video i read the teaching instructions it's it's it is so evil it is so perverse that to think that anybody could stand by and do nothing <clears throat> while, our, while our children are being programmed <clears throat> is beyond me. <clears throat> okay. Number eight Illuminati goal. Use of alcohol, drugs, corruption, and all forms of vice and crime to systematically corrupt the youth of the nation. Why do you think that our youth heroes, white middle class, black middle class, it doesn't matter what race or ethnic group, why do you think the heroes of our youth, boys and girls, a, a good many of them, sing gangster rap, drive around in, in black escalades, and they glorify the gangster culture, you know, slapping their, their girlfriends like... The, they're pimps and their girlfriends are whores, and on and on it goes. They're glamorizing and glorifying, <clears throat> especially among young people, <clears throat> gangster criminal behavior. But it's not just young people. What do you think it is when uh, uh, Francis Ford Coppola glamorizes the Italian mob in The Godfather? Or what's his name? Chino's in the movie, and, and De Niro's in the movie. And I forgot the name of the director. You know who he is. He did the movie uh, uh, Casino, and he glamorizes the mafia lifestyle. Okay, so what you have, and even Denzel Washington, who's one of my favorite actors, he really is. Personally, I think he sold out. He did a movie called American Gangster, which was the story of kind of an African-American Italian mafia chieftain. But 
the end result is it glamorizes and deifies the gangster lifestyle. That's what the communists, that's part of their game plan. Use alcohol, drugs, corruption, and all forms of vice to systematically corrupt the youth of the nation. Do you know, statistically, how many young girls, I'm talking about young, young girls, that their greatest dream in life is to be porn stars or strippers? It's a huge percentage of young girls. It's because it's been glamorized. Number nine Illuminati goal. Seize property by any means. But let's remember, when the Illuminati seize property, they don't, they don't let you seize their property. The Illuminati, which is the 1%, it's all about stealing your property. <clears throat> In parentheses, when people are deprived of the opportunity or legal right to own their own home, land, or property, their innate sense of dignity, responsibility, self-worth, and power is destroyed. You need to read that paragraph about 20 times. It's a gold mine in understanding the psychology of conquest of people. Okay? Once any possibility of owning property is destroyed by seizure, any possibility of owning property is destroyed and laws, the deeply, identi- the deeply embedded identity of people is rebranded forever. The people without the right to own property begin to see themselves as slaves, migrants, mere workers, and whose spirits have been irreparably broken. Therefore, the Illuminati will use any pretense necessary to seize private property, such as fair wealth redistribution, social justice, or environmentalist movements such as the Green New Deal. Okay, the way this works is the communists have their, the communist revolutionaries have their dig down. There is both a physical component when they steal your property and possessions, as well as a more powerful psychological necessity and psychological component to stealing your property, your house, your condo, and your possessions. They know that if they can steal your property, your car, your possessions, your your condo, they know that psychologically they have broken your spirit. They They have branded you in your psyche and now believe that you're a slave, a helpless slave, and it's being done intentionally. With all this finance, what do you think the finance are crying out loud? What do you think the financial reboot is really, really all about? Okay, parentheses. Once any possibility of owning property is destroyed by seizure and laws, the deeply embedded identity of a people is rebranded forever. It goes right into the psyche. The people without the right to own property begin to see themselves as slaves, migrants, mere workers, and whose spirits have been irreparably broken. Therefore, the Illuminati will use any pretense necessary to seize property, such as fair wealth redistribution, social justice, not fair wealth, it should be say I should have said unfair wealth redistribution, social justice or environmentalist movements such as the Green New Deal. Number ten Illuminati goal use use of slogans such as equity, liberty, and fraternity is delivered into the mouths of the masses in psychological warfare. By the way, that slogan, liberty, fraternity, and equity. Those were the exact slogans of the French Revolution. Now, there's so much more, man. There's so much more. That's more intense, heavier, things like control the press. And I haven't even got to the the real reason that they're controlling the press. I'll leave it with this, because we're out of time for today. It was apparent to me about nine months ago, my projection was that Every single mainstream media, television network, entertainment companies, 
etc., cetera, etc., cetera, would most likely, all of them, would suffer a loss of approximately 50% of their watchers, viewers, listeners, or fans. That projection turned out to be almost 100% accurate. All across the board, every media company, every news company, every mainstream media company, every network, all across the board, they have all lost anywhere between 40% and 60% of their audience. And the reason for that is, if the truth was really known, the masses of people in America are sick to their stomachs in watching this puke-filled propaganda that, that's immoral, that's obscene, that's degenerate, that rips apart America night after night. The people are speaking, and they're not watching it anymore. All right, we're out of time. And that's unfortunate. I could go for another two hours. I'm praying and thinking about doing this program and then doing a late-night show, maybe live, maybe live, where we really get into it even deeper. So I need your prayers, okay? I'm very serious about this. Why? Because we're in a battle for the hearts and minds of mankind. We're in the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. And it's a battle of ideas. It's information warfare. The other thing is, the Lord has put it in my heart that there are significant changes about to erupt upon America. And most people are totally unprepared for what's going to happen soon. God's people need to be prepared. We need to evangelize. We need to reach people with the word of God while we still can. And we must strategically take a stand using effective strategies so we can preserve our freedoms, um, our nation, our religion, our free speech. And now's the time to do it because the doors of freedom and the doors of opportunity are not going to stay open forever. They're open because of God's grace, his unmerited favor. And so, as I've been seeking the Lord, I feel this increasing pressure in my inner man, this building up um, of the Holy Spirit in my inner man. And I sense that the Lord, I keep getting pictures, and I keep sensing that the Lord, the Lord telling me, not telling me, I, it's like I sense the Lord ordering me, and saying, Paul, I want you to expand the electronic scope of your communication of the ministry, Paul McGuire Ministries in Paradise Mountain Church. I want you to expand your radio outreach, your video outreach, your television outreach, your internet outreach, your social media platform outreach, your film uh, uh, developments. You, right now, I'm t- churning out my 35th and 36th book because people have answers for what's going on, and I'm racing to get that to the publisher. But look, the, the central battle is spiritual. I want to thank God <clears throat> from from the soul of my being <clears throat> for every one of you that are waging warfare for me, my ministry, <clears throat> my family, and our outreach, I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. <clears throat> I think you can feel the intensity of emotion I have when I say I want to thank you for being a spiritual warrior for me, my family, and this ministry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you for spreading our messages far and wide so that We have successfully withstood uh, three separate attacks, three separate attempts to take us off the Internet, to strip us off video and social media platforms for no reason whatsoever. That was legitimate. Because you have stood with me, we have weathered those storms, but there's worse storms coming. We're not backing down, by the way. And I want to thank you for your intercessory prayers 
regarding the expansion and growth of this ministry. All wars, and I write about it in my book, The Day the Dollar Died, World War I, World War II was financed by the international banking banks. The same Warburg family that financed Hitler, same Wall Street bankers that financed Hitler, financed the communists and America too. Odd, isn't it? In all warfare, in order to win a war, you have to have sufficient finances and assets to purchase the weapons and the assets you need to win the war. Let's not be childish. You can't win the war without the finances. All wars are financed. You know why we had wars on the streets of America and riots? Because there were billionaires with deep pockets generously financing those wars with the intended agenda of bringing America down. So I want to to challenge you as your brother in Christ. We need to wage war in the battle of the mind and the heart to win back our nation before it, it's taken from us. So I want you to go before the Lord and ask the Lord with a childlike heart, Lord, I've heard what Paul McGuire said. Pray about it. Say, Lord, how much money do you want me to give in terms of donations, finances, and contributions? And then wait on the Lord. If he speaks to you then, or he speaks to you hours later, or a day later, or whatever, when the Lord speaks to you, and he will, if you truly seek the Lord in a childlike way, the Lord will speak to you. So when the Lord speaks to you, which he will, then all I ask is that you simply obey the Lord and whatever God tells you to do in terms of giving and donations. I don't care if it's the largest gift you ever gave in your life. If the Lord has supplied it and arranged it, then if God tells you to give it or part of it or whatever God tells you to do, Obey him. Give the amount that God is telling you to give. If it's a modest amount, but you're giving it on a regular basis, all I ask you to do is obey the Lord and give whatever amount God is telling you to do on whatever basis God is telling you to do. If it's what we would consider a small amount, and I don't believe there's any such thing as a small amount, by the way, because if every one of you listening would really go to the Lord and ask the Lord how much you should give financially or how much you should contribute financially to this ministry, and you actually did it, if you added up all those relatively smaller amounts, we would be able to meet our war spiritual war year budget just as easily. See, I mean, I've said this before, you know what I'm talking about. If lots of people are faithful to give small amounts, it all adds up. We're fine. But if there's a lesser amount of people who give large amounts, we're also fine. fine. The key is obedience. And it's, it's important for you to obey for your own spiritual sake, but it's important for you to obey in terms of the fact that we are, yes, we are in the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world. And order our books at paulmcguire.us. In fact, you can make a donation at paulmcguire.us. We have secure lines. You can donate through a variety of uh, credit cards or systems of your choice, the one you're comfortable with. They're secure. And you type in the amount of money you want to donate. And pray for us. We pray for you. And we're in this together, man. Because, look, we've got to win the battle now while the door's still open. And that's the only reason I'm in it. I have children. I expect to have grandchildren. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. I sure hope he'd come back tonight. But if he doesn't, then we're supposed to occupy until he comes. God bless you. Thank you for listening. This is Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's Paul McGuire.